I bring a message from your master, Marcus Licinius Crassus, commander of Italy, by command of his most merciful excellency, your lives are to be spared. Academics you were, and academics you remain. But the terrible penalty of crucifixion has been set aside on the single condition that you simply admit that not literally every single person in ancient Rome was gay. They weren't. They all, were all gay. They 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 were all gay. He enjoyed being the receiver in relationships with men. They were they all gay. They were all gay. All of them gay. Records show that Roman men were free to seek the company of another man without any consequences. The ancient Romans were so liberal about their sexual adventures that they did not even have a word for homosexuality. Rumors abound, especially online, about homosexuality in the ancient world. I'm sure you've seen them. Small snippets from a historical treatise or a detail about a Roman emperor's life shared as a meme. If you see enough of these things online, it could start to give you the impression that maybe being gay wasn't all that uncommon back then. Today we'll be going into great depth about this topic, establishing a full landscape and context from which to properly understand it, and we will be looking at ancient Rome in particular. I hope to give you all enough information in this video so that by the end you will have a complete understanding of their societal attitudes towards the topic, how commonplace it was, in what sort of places it may have occurred, and Overall, I aim to show you through ample historical reference that homosexuality was neither very commonplace nor ever accepted at any point in ancient Rome. Now, my motivation in making this video is primarily to correct the historical record. For decades, academics bemoaned the fact that ancient homosexuality was ignored or systematically suppressed by the stuffy scholars of yesteryear. They believed that the more conservative sensibilities of the past prevented an honest discussion of the issue, and to an extent, they may be right. In my experience, translations from, say, before the 1970s would often leave passages which were too sexual or scatological untranslated. Fundamentally, they believed that these older scholars were interpreting Rome through their own contemporary lenses, ignoring the inconvenient or the uncomfortable. But in trying to write this wrong, modern scholars have ironically made the exact same mistake, going way too far in the opposite direction and overemphasizing ancient homosexuality. They attempt to paint Rome as a progressive place in which being gay was commonplace and even accepted. So much like how these older scholars were interpreting Rome through their own contemporary lenses, modern scholars take our own society's acceptance of homosexuality and apply it to ancient Rome and we end up with a myriad of popular misunderstandings for it. I will therefore be arguing against this idea that homosexuality was accepted or commonplace at any point in ancient Rome, so that I can push back against this hopefully temporary overcorrection of scholarship. And now that brings me to clearly defining the question of the video. Despite the title, we're not actually going to be asking, were the ancient Romans gay, like how modern homosexuals are gay? That's a boring question. The answer is no, and everybody, even the pro-gay scholars, agree upon that. The Roman homosexuals that did exist and modern gays have almost nothing in common. Instead, we're going to be asking the much more pointed question. To what extent did male-on-male -male relationships occur in ancient Rome, and did the Romans by and large view them as unproblematic? And these are the two criteria to which I will constantly be referring back how commonplace it was, and how accepted it was. I will be showing through hundreds of references to primary documents that, at least in ancient Rome, it was likely neither. And a note on those citations. They are extremely extensive in this video, including literally hundreds of quotes. But as I don't want to make this video unwatchable, whenever I have multiple historical or scholarly references which support a point that I'm trying to make, I will put on the screen and read only a handful. And I will put in a citations document that you can see in the video description many more quotes which support that same point. So for anyone who wants to really dive deep into the subject, I recommend watching the video with that citations document open, and you can look them up as we go along. Anybody else, just sit back and enjoy. Now, right off the bat, we need to establish some background knowledge and set up some caveats that we will need to be aware of in this discussion. Otherwise, it's all too easy to get a false sense of understanding, or to fall into the trap of analogizing totally alien Roman practices 
with modern day ones, when in reality they have nothing but a surface level commonality. So now first caveat, and if you remember anything, remember this one. It is impossible to know for a certainty what Roman society would have thought of what we call homosexuality. Not only are we of course separated by time and cultural distance, but the Romans actually wrote very little about sexuality at all. What has been written about Roman sexuality in the modern age is gleaned from hundreds of different works, most of which only very tangentially mention the topic at all. And references specific to homosexuality are even more rare. Historians are attempting to reconstruct something as complicated as what millions of people across a huge time period thought about the rather niche topic of male-on-male -male sex. So just keep that in mind. We're trying to build a rather complicated jigsaw puzzle here, and we're probably missing 90% of the pieces. Another problem with the debate is that it focuses on a narrow scope of Roman history and pretends that it represents the whole. To begin, Rome lasted a long time, around 1200 years, or more if you feel the need to be a contrarian. The period that pro-gay scholars tend to focus on runs from 200 BC to 200 AD, the Late Republic and Early Imperial Ages. Left out of this, of course, is two-thirds of Roman history. And this for the simple fact that these 800 years were extremely anti-gay. Looking at the period leading up to and after 200 AD, we begin to see emperors taking first moral and later legal stances against homosexuality. As early as the start of his reign in 138 AD, Antoninus Pius, the successor to Hadrian, was strongly opposed to homosexual behavior. His successor and adoptive son, Marcus Aurelius, seemed to condemn all such activity too, and wrote in his famous meditations that Antoninus Pius taught him to, quote, suppress all passion for young men implying that this was obviously a good thing. In the 240s AD, homosexual prostitution was made illegal, while heterosexual prostitution remained conspicuously untouched. What could be considered the final nail in the coffin comes from the Theodosian Codes, a set of laws written under Christian emperors started in 312 AD. Later in 390 AD, a law was added which sentenced homosexuals to public execution by fire, and I quote, All persons who have the shameful custom of condemning a man's body, acting the part of a woman to the sufferance of alien sex, for they appear not to be different from women, shall expiate a crime of this kind in avenging flames in the sight of the people. Now, perhaps it would have sufficed to simply say that Rome became Christian in 313 AD, which would have all but guaranteed their anti-gay stance. But I include this extreme example to illustrate the lengths of their hatred. Now, examining that period before 200 BC, which includes the monarchy and the early republic, really quality historical records from this period are more difficult to come by, and much of what we have is mixed with a healthy dose of mythology. But what we do have does point to a culture which disapproved of homosexual behavior. It is recorded by Livy, for example, that male sexual assault, even of slaves, was punished. And this is corroborated by Valerius Maximus who wrote that pudicitia, that is Roman chastity, was defended by law. This concept of pudicitia is surprisingly deep and specific to the Roman context, but it did include the concept that nobody was to violate the body of a Roman citizen. And this was often, although not exclusively, referring to sexual violation. This is all to say that it was likely illegal for a man to penetrate another man or to be penetrated. Valerius Maximus later suggests that voluntarily engaging in homosexual acts was condemned in early Republican times. So before we've even examined any of the pro-gay claims, we can already consider two-thirds of Roman history to have been violently anti-gay. But there's more. Pro-gay side tends only to discuss the opinions of those people from the city of Rome itself, which only contained a small fraction of the empire's population. Now, of course, to be fair to the pro-gay scholars, the focus on people from the city comes partly out of necessity. Most of our surviving documents were written by the city elite for the city elite. But I think the point still stands that most of the population of Rome did not live in Rome. If we want a full understanding of what Rome thought of homosexuality, then these country folk have to be considered. And from the little insight that we do get into their sexual practices, they seemed to have disdained homosexuality. One law passed by Julius Caesar protected citizens from being forced to sit next to known homosexuals at public events, and this was specifically for use in Italian towns outside of Rome. Minutius Felix, writing at the tail end of the period we're examining, uses the term urbanitas to refer to people who were tolerant of homosexuality indicating that this practice was perceived to be more prevalent in the cities among the urbanites. Obviously, if we only consider the sexual attitudes of those in the city, it will not give us a clear indication of what everyone in Rome thought. And even within the city of Rome, we have again to severely limit our scope, as most of what we're going to be discussing concerns only the upper echelon of society. As a rule, the lower classes had very little written about them, let alone about the specifics of their sexuality. So, putting the plebs aside, the opinions we're going to be examining come almost exclusively from either the senatorial class or one rung below them in the equestrian class. The senatorial class would consist of a few hundred men and their families, while the equestrian class might consist of as many as a few thousand men and their families. So we have in total a few thousand families that would have represented less than 2% of the population of the city of Rome proper, and they would have represented a vanishingly small percentage of the rest of the empire. Now, is it possible that the plebs of the city sometimes engaged in homosexual acts? Well, maybe, but it's hard to tell. Our sources on this matter are tangential at best, and everything that we do have 
seems to suggest that they generally had a more conservative sexual outlook. So we've already narrowed the discussion to the elites from a particular time period, and generally speaking, only those from the city of Rome itself. One could legitimately ask if we haven't already sort of disproved this idea of a widespread acceptance of homosexuality in Rome. But of course we'll go deeper, because now we have to ask ourselves, how far can we even trust the historical sources that we have? Now, this isn't some sort of conspiratorial take where I denounce anything that doesn't agree with my preconceived notions. Rather, it's to bring up the real difficulties that come with doing history. In examining our question in particular, the majority of the writings which identify homosexual behavior at the time are political, and most of them are meant to denigrate whoever they're accusing. For one example, take Cicero and the rest of the Senate who make a joke on the Senate floor at Caesar's expense, alluding to an alleged sexual relationship of his with King Nicomedes, saying, everyone knows what he gave you and what you gave him. <laughs> we really have to ask ourselves, how seriously should we take the accusations that Julius Caesar was a homosexual when it comes from the people that would in a few months' time stab him to death. Even pro-gay scholars are quick to recognize this fact. The author of Roman Homosexuality recognizes several times that, quote, men engaging in public quarrel were quite capable of hurling accusations of sexual outrage at each other, often without any basis in fact. And this brings up another good point. Many of the historical sources we have which attest to some form of homosexual behavior are simply accusations almost always political and always meant to be negative. So not only do we have to be careful in blindly trusting these sources, but the mere fact that many of these are negative accusations should by itself tell us a lot about what they thought on the issue. You simply wouldn't try to publicly denigrate an opponent by calling them gay if nobody cared that they were gay. And lastly, I need to stress that whatever went on in ancient Rome at this time, absolutely should not be conflated with modern homosexuality. Calling them gay in the modern sense is completely off the mark. First, lesbianism was completely unheard of. There are practically no references to female-on-female -female relationships in Rome, and the very few that we do have are negative. As for men, the instances of male-on-male -male relationships that did occur in ancient Rome were almost always between a Roman citizen and his slave, or a Roman citizen and a non-citizen boy. These relationships were almost always forced, and therefore extremely abusive. And the citizen would have, as a rule, played the so-called active or the penetrative role, lest he sacrifice his masculinity to a social inferior. More on this dynamic later. Now, while these sorts of relationships did occur, any other form of homosexuality was universally condemned by all at all times. They had a strong disgust for adult male-on-male -male relationships. A man harboring romantic feelings for another man would have been looked upon with intense skepticism. It was especially looked down upon for a man to be the receiving partner in a sexual encounter, and homosexual marriage never existed. In fact, almost all of the pro-gay scholars again agree that the two have almost nothing in common, and calling the Romans gay is just wrong. The fact that these scholars will recognize this and yet continue to use the word homosexual to describe the Romans is extremely frustrating to me. And I'm forced to assume that this is done for political reasons, because obviously homosexuality is a charged political topic in our modern day. To associate the ancient Romans with homosexuality, to say that it was unproblematic for them, it's not only a lie, but it implicitly argues for the acceptance of homosexuality today, which reeks of political bias. If the Romans accepted it and they were such a great society, then why shouldn't we? This duplicitous argument where they will use the word homosexual, but then clarify usually somewhere deep within their book that, oh, we didn't actually mean homosexual, is a large part of why I'm making this video. It's a complete Mott and Bailey, and not enough has been done to push back against the misunderstandings that have resulted from it. So with that established, I want to now discuss a little bit about Roman society itself. And we will begin with the Roman ideal of masculine behavior, called virtus. Virtus is probably best translated as valor or virtue, but it has a definite, near-exclusive association with men. In in fact, etymologically, it literally means manliness, vir being Latin for man. It is a quality that only men can achieve, or women on very rare occasion, if they display typically manly virtues. Acting like a man, that is, with virtus, was central to Roman life. It was even in a way worked into their legal system. The head of a Roman household was the father, or the pater familius. He had almost total legal power over all members of the family, and this power was called the patria potestas. If the father caught his married daughter cheating, for instance, then he was legally allowed to kill her and her lover. Now, we don't know if this ever actually happened, but it was on the books. The man and his masculinity were central to Roman life. Now, one of the most stereotypically feminine traits, which men should ideally seek to avoid, was seeking too much sex. To the Romans, this was a quality of somebody driven by their lust rather than their reason, so feminine. It wasn't unheard of for men who were deemed to be too sexually active to be called effeminatus, even though they only ever had sex with women. Sort of related to this idea is what was discussed in medical texts at the time, which held that a man's vigor was released during sex, so pursuing too much of it would weaken him. So vital was the preservation of a man's energy that sometimes gladiators, or anyone else who needed to preserve their energy, were infibulated, which without getting into too much detail is the use of a pin to prevent any such activity that might lead to release. But I digress. 
The point is that to not be sexually conservative was to violate the Roman imperative of maintaining virtus. It was everything to a Roman man, especially given how important one's reputation and social standing were at the time. And the standards were strictly enforced. What they considered violations of virtus might seem quite tame to us today. Take the case where Marcus Porcius Cato, consul in 195 BC and censor in 184 BC, expelled one Manilius from the Senate because he had kissed his wife in broad daylight in front of his children. Or take Cicero, who commented that excessive lust for women was considered a disease. And included in this concept of virtus was not just sexual conservatism, but bodily sovereignty. Now, typically this concerned freedom from physical aggression or assaults, but it did sometimes explicitly extend to the realm of sexual bodily sovereignty, i.e. not being penetrated. It makes a sort of sense. Virtus is associated with being a man. In sex, women are the ones who are typically penetrated. So for a man to be penetrated was to act like a woman and therefore to lack virtus. And now this is one of the most important points to understand when discussing so-called Roman homosexuality. They absolutely despised sexually passive men, men who let themselves be penetrated. They were willingly taking the role of a woman, which was unthinkable to a Roman. Here are some quotes to get the point across. There will be a good number here and even more in the citations. Valerius Maximus tells us that one father, a former censor, had his son killed for being a passive homosexual. There are at least three instances I found where men or boys who were either threatened with or actually endured buggery opted to commit suicide, including in the case of the gladiator Sporus. According to Suetonius, Emperor Domitian refused to accept donations from a man who was described as a homosexual passive. The fable writer Phaedrus explains that homosexual passives were made by a drunken accident of Prometheus. Then, with his wits half asleep and in a drunken mistake, he wove the maiden's organs onto the male type, and attached male members to women. So it is that lust now enjoys its depraved delight. Tacitus, commenting in quite positive terms on how Germans dealt with passive homosexuals, wrote the following. They make the punishment fit the crime. They hang traitors and turncoats from trees. While cowards and the unwarlike and those who are infamous with respect to their bodies, they drown in muddy bogs, pressing a wicker framework on top of them. The distinction in punishment has this meaning, that crimes should be made public when they are being punished, but sins should be hidden. Again, please check the citation for more examples. I really cannot stress enough just how far the Roman hatred for sexually passive men extended. And I'm really not even cherry picking here. There just aren't any instances where sexually passive men are considered something that is okay. Even among the pro-gay scholars, this is just something that is not up for debate. Another walk of life which proves the dislike of homosexual passives is the performing arts. Yes, plays, which confusingly, some pro-gay scholars cite to prove that homosexuals were accepted and commonplace. They will often, for example, discuss Juvenal, a satirical playwright active from around 100 to 130 AD. He lived at the height of opulence in the empire, when the Colosseum was built, where as many as 9,000 animals were killed in a single day for entertainment. Choosing Using to cite Juvenal to prove that homosexuality was unproblematic, though, is laughable for a few reasons. First, you should understand that, unlike in ancient Greece, the theater was not considered a high-class form of entertainment to the Romans. There were a few different attempts to ban plays altogether in the city, and there were two different attempts by Trajan and Tiberius to expel all actors from Rome, both of which were successful for a short while. Additionally, actors were very likely not allowed to vote. They couldn't be soldiers, and senators and equestrians were barred from associating with them. I think you get the picture, they were not very well received. And as for the theater itself, it had a reputation for attracting people of ill repute, drunks, pimps, prostitutes, and the like. And typically the raunchiness of the plays matched the clientele. Enter Juvenal's second satire which viciously attacked men who deviated from the sexual norms at the time, with a strong focus on homosexuals. From this satire alone, we get the following sections. Our narrator begins the play by saying how he'd like to flee to the ends of the earth because of how he sees homosexuality spreading, especially among hypocritical philosophers, who are supposed to be morally upright. I'd like to flee this place, go far beyond the Sarmatians and icy ocean, while those who pretend to the Kyrie's virtue but live like Bacchanals have the gall to preach to us of morality. Later, a character named Criticus, who walks around in a sheer gown essentially exposing himself and acting effeminate is rebuked with the line, a contagion has brought this blot upon you, and it will be passed on to many others, just as one pig scabs and mange lay low an entire herd in the field, or a discolored grape just by being seen taints another. At some point you will dare something more odious than this getup. That last line probably references this effeminate man's likelihood to engage in homosexual sex. It is later recommended that this man cut off his genitals. So what are they waiting for? The time for cutting off their extra flesh with knives in the Phrygian style has now come. Later, our narrator bemoans a fictitious male-on-male -male wedding. A man who once bore the holy relics as they swayed on a sacred strap and who sweated under those hallowed shields, now bears a long bridal gown with lace and a veil. O Romulus, father of the city, where does this atrocity come from that is so ruinous to the Latin shepherds? O Gradivus, from where springs this itch that has infected your descendants? Behold, a man, renowned for his high birth and wealth, is given to another man in marriage. And the entire satire is like this, extremely homophobic by today's standards. Now, while you could, and I bet many of you will, 
argue that because this play exists, it shows that the homosexuals must have also existed, this is a pointless argument. Of course, nobody is saying that gays didn't exist at all, only that they weren't accepted by society at large. And the fact that this extremely popular play exists, which ruthlessly berates them, shows exactly what the people thought of homosexuals. This play simply could not have been made in a society which accepts them. Imagine a Netflix special telling gays to castrate themselves. It's unthinkable because our society is, by and large, accepting of homosexuals, and theirs was not. In the past, if homosexuality wasn't merely condemned socially, but legally as well, most notably by the Lex Scantinia. This set of laws from the 2nd century BC is subject to varied interpretations, mostly because we don't have the original texts in their entirety, but rather the law was preserved in the Digest of Justinian, created in the early 6th century AD. Different scholars have stated that they believe the Lex Scantinia forbids male homosexuality, or that it sets the death penalty for convicted homosexuals. Some are more reserved and say that it simply banned pederasty, or that it penalized the willing passive homosexual partner. In any case, it's clear that the law targeted passive homosexual men in some capacity, as well as homosexual buggerers. Here are some of the details recorded in the digest. First, the law classifies those who are to be considered infames. An infame, a person suffering infamia, was someone formally and legally stripped of their social standing and legal protections, who lacked the protection from corporeal punishment afforded to citizens, a sort of outcast from polite society. People who were considered infames, according to the Lex Scantinia, are those condemned to death, those who fight animals for a living, actors, pimps, dishonorably discharged soldiers, as well as, quote, a man who has undergone womanish things in his body. In other words, a homosexual passive. This should give you a good idea of their relative social standing. And note that this did not include men who were assaulted, they were excluded from being considered among the infames. And this was a pretty serious label. Anyone considered infame was unable to serve in the army, unable to serve on a jury, to vote, or to represent others in court. So this had the very real effect of robbing these people of their civic rights. The largest all-pervading effect, however, would have been the ruin of one's reputation. We're also told in the digest that anyone who commits sexual outrage or stuprum against a freeborn boy or any woman was to be put to death. We can garner some information about its societal impact from other writings too. The author Ausonius wrote in an epigram that the Semivir, or half-man, a colloquial term for a sexual passive, fears the Scantinian law. In Juvenal's second satire, just discussed, the law is referenced by a woman chatting with a homosexual man. She also tells him that he ought to fear the Scantinian law. Later, the three Christian writers who commented on the Lex Scantinia all described it as, quote, fearsome suggesting something about its strictness and manner of enforcement. Obviously, the fact that the passive man was so looked down upon, the fact that they had legislation drawn up against them, draws a stark line between what went on in Roman times and modern homosexuality. But even beyond the actual act of submitting to being the passive partner itself, doing anything that made yourself appear more feminine also opened you up to censure to being deemed effeminatus, or moles, meaning soft. And accusations of this nature are extremely abundant in the written record, especially against political opponents. There are literally thousands of examples of men being attacked for being effeminate in some way. Remember how important Virtus was to them. Most common were insults of someone's feminine appearance, since this would have been the most visible target. Commonly attacked were men who had lisps, put their hand on their hip, wore makeup, plucked their body hair, or indeed care too much about their hair. In fact, men who were caught scratching their head with one finger were often deemed effeminatus because it was thought that they were trying to avoid messing up their hairdo and this is something that only a pansy would care about. Seneca complains of the youth of his days, writing, Observe the indolent young men of today. Their brains sleep. Not one of them can stay awake in the pursuit of a worthwhile project. Their minds are possessed by sleep, laziness, and an industry in the pursuit of wicked ends more reprehensible than sleep and laziness. Lubricious pleasure in singing and dancing rules these effeminates. Their preferred way of living leads them to arrange their hair exquisitely, to mold their voices until they are as sweet as those of women, to compete with women in the softness of their bodies, decking themselves out in filthy fineries. Cicero, in his screed against Catiline, said the following, These men whom I see flitting about the forum, standing before the Senate House, even going into meetings of the Senate, glistening in their perfumed oils, gleaming in their purple clothing, I would rather Catiline had led them out of Rome as his fellow soldiers. For if they remain here, bear in mind that it is not so much that army of his we will have to fear but these men who have deserted his army. And he later writes disapprovingly of a group of men, whom you see with combed hair, glossy, either beardless or heavily bearded, with tunics down to their fingertips and toes, wearing sails, not togas. In these flocks, all gamblers, all adulterers, all impure men and unchaste men are tumbled about together. And Juvenal, again in his second satire, writes the following of gay men. On the advice of them, women marry and then quickly divorce. In their society, they dispel boredom or enliven business. From them, they learn to wiggle their hips and whatever else the teacher knows. But beware, that teacher is not always what he seems. That man who 
wears makeup and dresses like a woman is an adulterer. Suspect him the more for his soft voice and effeminate gestures. He is a valiant man at arms in bed. And I could easily list several dozen more examples without exhausting all that I've come across. See the citation for more. The point is, it is extremely apparent that effeminate men were detested by Romans. Some pro-gay scholars have attempted to argue that the Romans didn't dislike these traits because men were doing them. Rather, they would dislike them if men or women did them. They just hated it in a gender-neutral sort of manner. The problem is, we have many instances of women being disparaged for displaying typically manly virtues, meaning it was preferred they acted like women. Also, the ideal Roman woman, the Matrona, was a chaste mother who looked after the house and kids, and who didn't involve herself in politics. Better still was the Univira, a woman who has only ever slept with one man, her husband. Feminine qualities were only considered absolutely negative when they were displayed by a man because it was considered unnatural and undesirable for a man to act like a woman in any regard. But now back to effeminate behavior and how it relates to homosexuality. The Romans didn't believe that all effeminate men were necessarily engaging in homosexual sex. However, very much like today, they saw a strong correlation between the two. Take this quote by Scipio Aemilianus, consul in 147 BC. Later in 142 BC, he attacked one P. Sulpicius Gallus publicly by saying, For the kind of man who adorns himself daily in front of a mirror, wearing perfume, whose eyebrows are shaved off, who walks around with plucked beard and thighs, who, when he was a young man, reclined at banquets next to his lover, wearing a long-sleeved tunic, who is as fond of men as he is of wine. Can anyone doubt that he has done what chinedi are in the habit of doing? Now that word he used, chinedi, is the plural of the word chinedus, which should best be translated into English as a six-letter F word. So here he's insinuating that this man has engaged in homosexual sex and he is tying it to these other feminine traits. Those of you who watched my video debunking ancient Greek homosexuality, probably see the similarity to the Greek word kinaidos. And indeed, chinedos is simply the Latinized form of that word. It was probably the most common label given to these men, and it was always used negatively. Now, a lot of scholars would disagree with me that the best translation for chinedos is a six-letter F word. But I mean, it denotes men who act or present themselves in an effeminate way. It's almost always used negatively, and there is a strong association with homosexual sex. That is exactly what it means today. Some of them say that it can't be the best translation because there are instances where straight men were called chinedus. But I think they must not get out very much, because it's far more common for men these days to call their straight friends chinedus than to call a gay man that. But I digress. The point is that the chinedus, either because of his effeminacy, his willing participation in homosexual sex, or both, was absolutely detested by all at all times. And of course, they didn't only call these men chinedus. No, they had a whole slew of slurs which they could throw at the effeminate and possibly homosexual men. This list includes soft or molis and effeminate or effeminatus as discussed above, but also concubine, chick, delicate, foul, wretched, weak, loose-belted, sick, shameless, and lastly, pathicus. This comes from the verb patior, which literally means to suffer or to undergo. The Romans used it exclusively to refer to passive homosexual male partners as they were thought to be suffering something. The ubiquity of pathicus in particular when referring to passive homosexual men again displays the hatred. So all in all, it is painfully obvious that effeminate men and especially sexually passive men were detested by Romans throughout the period we're examining. Now, if you were to argue this, the pro-gay scholars would actually agree with you. Yes, of course, the sexual passive was always detested throughout Roman history, but the active partner, they would say, the one who actually did the penetrating was always accepted. His role being considered essentially unproblematic because he was taking the masculine role in the act. Now, before doing the research for this video, I'd always thought that, while of course it isn't impossible that this idea existed, it never made sense to me on a logical level. Why would the Romans consider it a grave sin to be penetrated, but not realize that it takes two to tango? Why blame the corrupted and never the corrupter? And indeed, if we examine the historical record, we find not a small number of examples of the sexually active partner in a homosexual encounter being denounced. So when Pompey made an appearance at a public trial, Clodius, accompanied by a mob of rude and insolent villains, took up a conspicuous place and put to them questions of the following kind. Who is the general with no self-control? Who is the man who runs after other men? Who scratches his head with one finger? They, like a chorus trained in their answers, as he shook his toga, would reply to each question, shouting out, Pompey. Seneca relates to us the story of a man of ill repute. He was impure not with one sex only, but was eager for men as well as for women, specifying that his active homosexual sex brought on at least part of the disgust. Later, this man was apparently murdered, and Augustus promptly forgave the murderer, saying that it was justified based on this man's reputation. Catullus, in his tenth poem, refers negatively to a praetor as irumator, one who orally penetrates another. And in this case, he is referring to that act being done to a man. Next is the case of Milis Marianus, or the Marian soldier. This soldier in 104 BC was propositioned by his tribune. Not only did the soldier reject him, but killed him in retaliation for the insult. Marius, who was related to the slain tribune, ruled it a case of justifiable homicide. The Stoic Epictetus explicitly argues that active homosexuals are actually worse than passives writing, what does the pathic lose? 
He loses the character of man. What does he lose who makes the path of what he is? Many other things. And he also loses the man no less than the other. Suilius Caesonius narrowly avoided execution for his involvement in Messalina's orgy. According to Tacitus, this is because he was a passive partner in the acts. In the cases of Suilius Caesonius and Plautius Lateranus, the death penalty was remitted. Suilius was protected by his vices, since in the proceedings of that shameful rout, his part had been the reverse of masculine. All of these quotes paint a very different picture from what we've been told about homosexual acceptance in ancient Rome, that the active partner was considered unproblematic. The only reason we can really even surmise that there was some minuscule amount of adult male-on-male -male sex going on is because of these quotes denouncing it. Yes, of course, these quotes indicate that there was some homosexual acts going on at the time. But as far as indicating some sort of widespread acceptance, they do the opposite. And yet the myth of a homosexual Rome persists strongly in academia and online. So what else might they be basing their argument on? While Roman freeborn citizens detested passive homosexuals and certainly disliked active homosexuals, this restriction was less important for others, namely for two groups living in Rome, slaves and boys who were not citizens. Pro-gay scholars will argue that it was unproblematic for a Roman citizen to have sex with people from either of these two groups. So how true was that? Before I really get into this, I will mention the elephant in the room. That is, if we are discussing abusive sexual relationships forcibly imposed upon either a boy or a slave, we've already strayed a long way from anything resembling modern homosexual relationships. We are really stretching definitions here by calling the Romans gay. I will talk about these issues, however, because pro-gay scholars so often do. Let's start with the slaves. Now, legally speaking, it was possible for a Roman man to do pretty much anything he wanted to to his slave. They were essentially considered his property. And this is attested to in a few different places. Most of these have to do with masters and their female slaves. In this category belongs the man who has relations with his own slave mate, a thing which some people consider quite without blame, since every master is held to have it in his power to use his slave as he wishes. There are, however, several instances of men mentioning sexual relations with boys and men held as slaves. In a fictional story, Quintilian has a plebeian shout the following at some elites from Rome. You rich don't marry. You only have those toys of yours, those boy slaves that play women for you. The orator Heterius attempted in court to defend a freedman who had become a concubine to his patron by saying that, quote, unchastity is a matter of reproach for freeborns, a matter of duty for freedmen, and a matter of necessity for male slaves, trying to say that it was this man's duty to do anything his slave master wanted, and adding that male slaves have absolutely no say in the matter. And one last quote from Sempronius Gracchus, the equester of Sardinia in 124 BC. Upon his return to Rome, he boasts of his chastity with the following. I spent two years in the province. If any female prostitute came into my home, or if anyone's slave boy was accosted for my sake, you can think of me as the basest and most worthless person in the world. Considering that I so chastely kept myself from their slaves, you can reflect on how you think I treated your children. So this quote tells us a few things pretty clearly. First, that the popular morality would have condemned sex with slave boys right alongside prostitutes. However, the fact that he felt he needed to specify that he didn't abuse anyone's boy slaves does indicate that this probably happened from time to time. Playwrights also sometimes made mention of this idea of slaves being abused by their masters. In Juvenal's ninth satire, we get the following crude joke from a male slave who his master forces to be the active partner. Do you think it's an easy or straightforward thing to shove a proper into his guts, there to run into yesterday's dinner. The slave who has plowed the field will be less miserable than the one who has plowed the master. Another playwright named Plautus also included jokes at the expense of slaves. In one scene, a slave named Harpax, whose master is a soldier, is being berated by two other men. The insults end with this line. When the soldier went out at night on guard duty and you went with him, did his sword fit into your sheath? In another scene, a slave actually tells his master to assume a passive position on his hands and knees. Quote, like you used to when you were a boy. And this scene, and indeed all of these scenes are meant to be funny by the way. And yet another scene from a different play, one male slave notices another being propositioned by their master. And he says to the audience, my God, I do believe this guy wants to dig up the bailiff's bladder. Again, quite crass, but this was played for laughs. So while these quotes unfortunately indicate that there probably was some abuse of male slaves going on, after all, you couldn't joke about these sorts of things if nobody could relate to them. Notice that they all discuss the issue in a negative light or they have some sort of pathetic comic relief character saying it for laughs. Judge for yourself what that actually says about what people thought of this practice. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the multitude of voices which spoke out against the sexual abuse of slaves. And at least in my research, these quotes are more numerous and they come from men who, perhaps unsurprisingly, history has remembered more fondly. The stoic Musonius Rufus wrote, If one is to behave temperately, one would not dare to have relations with a prostitute, nor with a free woman outside of marriage nor even by Zeus with one's own slave woman. He expanded on this idea in his 12th lecture, writing, In this category belongs the man who has relations with his own slave mate, a thing which some people consider quite without blame, since every master is held to have it in his power to use his slave as he wishes. In reply to this, I have just one thing to say. If it seems neither shameful nor out of place for a master to have relations with his own slave, 
particularly if she happens to be unmarried, let him consider how he would like it if his wife had relations with a male slave. Would it not seem completely intolerable, not only if the woman who had a lawful husband had relations with a slave, but even if a woman without a husband should have? And yet surely one will not expect men to be less moral than women, nor less capable of disciplining their desires, thereby revealing the stronger in judgment inferior to the weaker, the rulers to the ruled. In fact, it behooves men to be much better if they expect to be superior to women. For surely if they appear to be less self-controlled, they will also be baser characters. What need is there to say that it is an act of licentiousness and nothing less for a master to have relations with a slave? Everyone knows that. Cato is known to have condemned the buying of slave boys, especially of one L. Cornelius Scipio. Why the invective against this one man in particular if the practice was so widespread? In Cato's most extreme example, a Roman lieutenant of his was forced to commit suicide as a punishment for buying slave boys on the battlefield. Not Roman citizens, but captives from a war. Not even Italians. Why was this punished so harshly? Tacitus tells us that even the slaves at orgies, which some might assume to be blameless, were condemned, and they were in all likelihood more commonly serving as the passive partner. So what we have dealing with the sexual abuse of slaves are crude jokes made at their expense on the one hand, and on the other, condemnations of the practice and harsh legal punishments for it. Does this sound like a culture that accepted this? I don't think so. The most we could say is that it probably wasn't considered as bad to abuse slaves as it was to be a passive homosexual. But to say that it was unproblematic is completely wrong. But moving on. The last area in which pro-gay scholars seek refuge for their theories is in the so-called pederastic relationships of Rome. A quick refresher on pederasty. The idea originated with the Greeks, where an adult male would form a bond with a young boy, around 12 to 20 years old. Now, despite what is sometimes believed online, these relationships were never intended to be sexual, as attested to by Lycurgus and many other ancient sources. They were meant instead to be educational, to teach the boy how he ought to behave and usher him into political life. In a minority of cases which were strongly opposed by a majority of the elites, these relationships did, however, turn pedophilic. See my video debunking ancient Greek homosexuality for more detail on this. Now, Roman pederasty did exist, but it differed slightly from the Greek in that the Romans, with their emphasis on virtus, were absolutely paranoid of the idea of these pairings turning sexual when it involved their freeborn sons. For this reason, relationships between younger and older men were looked upon with intense skepticism. But what if the relationship was between an older male citizen and a younger non-citizen boy? According to the pro-gay scholars, so long as this was the case, and the boy wasn't outside of the acceptable age range, again roughly 12 to 20 years old, then these relationships were considered unproblematic. Or at least that is what some of the more unscrupulous scholars might say. Some are more honest. I think the author of Roman Homosexuality put it very well, when he wrote, Pederastic relationships seem to have been no more objectionable to Roman traditionalists than were relationships with freeborn girls or with other men's wives. And this is essentially true. Pederasty was probably considered no worse than adultery. Of course, the problem is, adultery was hated by the Romans. Remember when I said above that the paterfamilias was allowed to kill his married daughter if he found her cheating. Adultery was a problem in the Roman world, but they never approved of it. Much like with homosexuality, there was even a strict set of laws passed to curb it. Namely, the Julian Law on punishing adulteries. This law also allowed a husband to kill the partner of his cheating wife if that partner was infamous. Any trial on the adultery was to be held in public. And if the woman was found guilty, she was forced to wear the clothing of prostitutes. If we want an idea of how much the Romans hated adultery, we can again look at political writings. More accusations of adultery were thrown out than even the all too abundant accusations of femininity and homosexuality. And again, we must assume that this means the general consensus was against it, because you wouldn't criticize someone for something that was unproblematic. Just for a few examples, Pompey, Mark Antony, and Augustus, among many others, were accused of adultery. Famously, Clodius, via his infiltration into the Bona Dei festival, had tried to seduce the wife of Julius Caesar for which he was castigated. Tacitus, again in glowing terms, discusses how the Germanics dealt with adultery. Thus, with their virtue protected, they live uncorrupted by the allurements of public shows or the stimulant of feastings. Clandestine correspondence is equally unknown to men and women. Very rare for so numerous a population is adultery, the punishment for which is prompt and in the husband's power. Having cut off the hair of the adulteress and stripped her naked, he expels her from the house in the presence of her kinsfolk and then flogs her through the whole village. The loss of chastity meets with no indulgence. Neither beauty, youth, nor wealth will procure the culprit a husband. So, in short, I find that this comparison between pederasty and adultery perfectly relays what they thought of the former. It is true that, again, compared to being a homosexual passive, cucking a guy wasn't nearly as bad. But there is room for nuance here. Something can obviously be not as bad and still not liked. So, with that said, was it ever the case that sexual pederastic relationships occurred in Rome? Yes. They are attested to by a number of sources. Take Seneca, who bemoans, I shall not mention the troops of luckless boys who must put up with other shameful treatment after a lavish banquet is over. I shall not mention the troops of catamites raided according to nation and color who must all have the same smooth skin. 
and the same amount of youthful down on their cheeks. So while it's unfortunate, it seems foolish to deny that these relationships did occur. However, there are a few things that we can say on the matter. First, again, obviously, if we are discussing modern homosexuality, this isn't it. Secondly, these relationships, to whatever extent they did occur, were strongly criticized, especially if they took place with a Roman freeborn boy. In fact, it was common political rhetoric to accuse your rivals of having submitted to an older man while in their youths. Take this passage, wherein Cicero accuses Mark Antony, his perennial rival, of having prostituted himself to a man named Curio in his youth. You took on a man's toga and at once turned it into a horse. At first you were a common prostitute. The price of your infamy was fixed, and not small either. But soon Curio turned up, drew you away from your meretricious trade, and as if he had given you a matron's robe, established you in lasting and stable matrimony. No boy bought for sexual gratification was ever so much in the power of his master as you were in Curios. And lastly, to bring up these pederastic attestations, without mentioning what I found to be the far more numerous examples of men denouncing the practice is just plain dishonesty. It does nothing but skew perceptions about how common and how accepted the practice was. Take Quintilian, commenting on the playwright and poet, Lysias Afranius. He excelled in Roman-style comedies, if only he hadn't polluted his plots with unseemly sexual affairs with boys, confessing his own habits. In a court case, Cicero attempts to discredit his opponent by implying that he is in a pederastic relationship with a foreign boy. He says of him, I know his type, his habits, his desires, of course implying the worst. Cicero later comments on pederasty again when discussing Catiline, and if you have any doubt as to the tone of this passage, Cicero wanted Catiline dead after his attempted coup d'etat, so this is meant to be scathing. But in what other man were there ever so many allurements for youth as in him, who both indulged in infamous love for others and encouraged their infamous affections for him, promising to some enjoyment of their lust, to others the death of their parents, and not only instigating them to iniquity, but even assisting them in it. But now how suddenly had he collected, not only out of the city, but even out of the country, a number of abandoned men. No one, not only in Rome, but in every corner of Italy, was overwhelmed with debt whom he did not enlist in this incredible association of wickedness. And there are many other instances of men being condemned for this behavior. See the citation for more. But the pro-gay scholars would say that these cases by and large are talking about Roman freeborn boys. If the relationship involved non-citizen boys, then it was no big deal. They cite as evidence for this the fact that there are far more instances of court cases, public condemnations, and the like, which deal with pederasty involving freeborns as opposed to foreign boys. This doesn't at all suggest, however, that the Romans viewed pederasty with foreign boys as unproblematic, only that they viewed getting their own sons buggered as far more objectionable. They simply are far more likely to care about the virtus of their own boys as opposed to that of strangers. And that's why these events were recorded and brought to court far more frequently. And besides, it's not like there aren't a large number of cases, some already cited above, in which the abuse of non-citizen boys was condemned. And I mean, of course it was going to be the case that people spoke out against the sexual abuse of young boys. This is objectively evil. The scholars who pretend that this practice was entirely unproblematic are just plain wrong. Insofar as we can divine some sort of consensus opinions from the writings we have, it's probably the case that the majority of even the elites opposed to the practice and certainly the majority of the common people viewed it as a disgusting perversion of the worst of the elites. And one last point to make about culture. It'll be well known, especially by tech bros, that Stoicism was popular during this time period. Central to Stoic philosophy was the teaching of self-control and self-mastery, something which was considered at odds with homosexual sex, because they thought that could only be done for self-gratification. Here are just a few quotes from Stoic philosophers commenting on homosexual sex. Musonius Rufus wrote the following, Those who do not live luxuriously, or who are not worthless, must conclude that the only justified sexual practices are those that are consummated within marriage for the purpose of creating children, since these practices are licit as well, and that those sexual practices which aim at mere pleasure are unjust and illicit even if they take place within marriage. He also describes male sex as, quote, against nature. The precursors to the Stoics all generally agree that homosexuality was wrong, including Plato, who said in his book Laws that sexual intercourse between men should be once and for all prohibited, and Aristotle, who likened homosexual sex to a disease which arises from those who are, quote, wantonly abused from childhood. Seneca seemingly never commented directly on male-on-male -on -male relationships as such, but did make several statements close enough to the topic. For instance, in this passage where he denounces the collection of beautiful slaves. Everyone's retinue of slaves is carried along, their faces made up to keep their delicate skins from harm by sun or cold. It is something to be ashamed of if there is a slave in your following of boys whose healthy complexion needs no cosmetics. Else the more stylish folk around you may say in disbelief, have you no girl favorite, no boy to rouse her envy? These are the voices of, quote, everyone that you must flee. These are the men who pass vice around and communicate it from one place to another. As stated above, Epictetus denounces both passive and active homosexuals, even putting more blame on the actives, writing, what does the pathic lose? He loses the character of man. What does he lose who makes the pathic what he is? 
many other things, and he loses the man no less than the other. And yes, it's true that we can't say for a certainty what impact these men's writings had on society and people's behavior. However, they were extremely popular thinkers at the time, often with wealthy patrons who thought it worthwhile to fund their work. The reason we still have their books is because they were copied and read widely, so it's not unreasonable to say that they did have a large impact on society. So now I think at this point you should have a basic understanding of what the Romans thought of homosexuality. In review, they absolutely detested adult male homosexuals, especially passives. Some Romans likely abused their male slaves, but this wasn't exactly an uncontested practice. Many of these sources which attested this behavior are satirical plays, and at times the sexual abuse of non-citizen boys occurred, although again, this was strongly contested. So with that background knowledge, I now want to go through more examples from history to more fully flesh out the scene of what was going on. Beginning with the emperors, I think it's fair to say that their lives have done a lot to influence people's ideas about just how gay Rome was. So let's spend a bit of time discussing their sexualities. We won't go through all of them as that would take too long, but we will hit the highlights, with a focus on those emperors who are accused of being gay. Starting with Julius Caesar. Yes, I know he technically wasn't an emperor, but I think it's important to talk about him because I think many people, even people who aren't very familiar with this topic, will have heard some sort of rumor that he was either gay or bisexual. This idea stems from a trip that Caesar took when he was around 20 years old to the kingdom of Bithynia in modern-day Turkey. While there, he stayed at the court of King Nicomedes, whom he petitioned to aid in raising a fleet for Rome. And he was successful in this, by the way. Unfortunately for Caesar, he stayed longer than was absolutely necessary at Nicomedes' court, and rumors began to spread that maybe he was sexually involved with the king. This despite the fact that there are a myriad of other explanations for his stay. He could have been shoring up political alliances. He could have been avoiding a return trip to Rome, or he simply could have enjoyed living at a king's court. This allegation followed him throughout his life, and of course became a favorite of his political rivals as his power grew. Eventually, the rumor was being repeated by all manner of senators and famous Romans, including the elder Curio, who coined the famous phrase which says that Caesar is a man to every woman and a woman to every man, as well as Cicero, who made a joke about it on the Senate floor. Now, importantly, according to Cassius Dio, Caesar always violently denied these accusations, despite the fact that he was also reportedly fine with people mocking him in any other regard, even welcoming the insults. You could make fun of his balding, the way he dressed, his womanizing tendencies, which were legendary, by the way, but to call him a passive homosexual was a step too far. In short, there is no evidence that Caesar was gay. It is pure hearsay. Thank you. And not once for the rest of his life was he accused of any homosexual escapades. And again, we have to bring up the fact that because this rumor was repeated so often, it really says something about how the Romans viewed passive homosexuality. They must have detested it. Next, Augustus. He was rumored to have been very sexually promiscuous, having had affairs with many married women. These accusations, however, came in large part from Mark Antony, undoubtedly his rival at the time trying to stir up resentment against the upstart emperor. He was in the habit of debauching young girls, who were procured for him from all quarters, even by his own wife. There's also much made of a passing mention to a slave boy named Sarmentus. According to Plutarch, a man named Delius, a friend of Mark Antony's, complains that while they were receiving sour wine in Egypt, Augustus' slave Sarmentus is drinking expensive Falernian wine in Rome, and that this slave was a delicie, meaning a plaything. Now, this is the only reference to Sarmentus in this capacity. Given that there is so little to go on, we don't know exactly what this entails. Some scholars, like Amy Richland, believe that, again, this was a rumor spread by Mark Antony and his followers in order to hurt Augustus. And I find this to be pretty reasonable given the other rumors they attempted to spread about the man. The only other reference I found to Augustus being a pederast was a seemingly untrustworthy piece of gossip which said that he slept with a dozen catamites in his bed. So these being the only references to Augustus as a pederast and the fact that they were likely spread by Mark Antony who was known to have spread many other rumors about Augustus makes me seriously doubt their legitimacy. But you can decide for yourself. If you do choose to believe Suetonius and Mark Antony and his friend, then it would have to be with the knowledge that this would make Augustus a supreme hypocrite, as he also passed a sweeping set of reforms known as the Julian Laws, mentioned in part above. These laws aimed in part to increase the number of children born to Roman citizens, but they also had a large focus on stamping out adultery in the city. So desperate was Augustus to increase the number of children being born to Roman citizens that he actually punished married couples who did not produce children, so state-enforced heterosexuality, basically. In short, there is nothing to suggest Augustus was gay, and he enforced an extremely conservative set of moral reforms on the people. Next, his successor, Tiberius. He's most famous as pertains to our question for his villa on Capri, which he decorated with hetero and homosexual art. Here, according to Suetonius, he acquired a reputation for still grosser depravities that one can hardly bear to tell or be told, let alone believe. For example, he trained little boys whom he termed tiddlers to crawl between his thighs when he went swimming, and tease him with their licks and nibbles. And unweaned babies he would put to his organ as though to the breast, 
being by both nature and age rather fond of this form of satisfaction. Now, these statements are beyond disgusting, and Suetonius tells us that is his opinion as well. So if it wasn't already obvious to you, this tells us that this behavior was not reflective of the social norms of the day. It wouldn't have been approved of. And if we want to take it a step further, we could legitimately ask how reliable Suetonius is on this matter. Tacitus and Dio, our two other main sources on Tiberius, make no mention of this behavior and Tacitus is generally considered either neutral or negative towards Tiberius. So not only was his behavior not reflective of the social norms of the day, those stories could very well just be made up. Another emperor famous for his debauchery was Nero. Was he gay? Well, if the reports are to be believed, then probably yes, or at least bisexual. According to Suetonius, while he did marry a few women, he also married a man named Pythagoras, to whom he played the feminine role. And he later married another man named Sporus, whom he had castrated. And I will point out here that homosexual marriages were never allowed at any point in Roman history. It was practically unthinkable outside of the context of a joke. And this, of course, brings up the fact again that the behavior of a Roman emperor is hardly reflective of the popular morality. Nero also reportedly kicked his pregnant wife to death and had his mother murdered. This is not an indication that these practices were widespread or unproblematic. In fact, these things were probably only recorded because they were shocking and detestable. Also remember that Nero was deposed in 68 AD, driven out of Rome by an angry mob, tried and found guilty in absentia and sentenced to death, although he ended up taking his own life, supposedly uttering the famous and very gay line, oh, what an artist the world loses in me, before doing so. His quote-unquote husband, Sporus, was going to be thrown into a gladiator show, but he opted to kill himself instead at the age of 20. Next, Emperor Galba. He only reigned for about seven months, but we do get one mention of him from Suetonius, who wrote that he was more inclined to unnatural desire, and in gratifying it preferred full-grown men. Again, a man being censured for his homosexual preferences. Caligula, same deal. Insofar as the stories about him are true, they are meant to be negative. Next, Elagabalus. He's an unimportant emperor historically, but he's remembered mostly today for being a sexual degenerate. It's said that he would often dress like a woman and put on makeup. At night, he reportedly dressed like a prostitute and saw how much money he could make. He also reportedly took a man named Heracles as a husband and performed oral sex on him publicly. Again, I think you get the point that these were not approved of behaviors. By the time Elagabalus was 18, the Praetorian Guard had decided to kill him. He tried to escape, but he was caught and his body thrown in the Tiber. The selection of emperors so far might have you thinking that they all behaved this way, but in fact, most were far more chaste and or decidedly not attracted to men or boys. Claudius, for example, was known as a womanizer, but was not at all into men. According to Suetonius, he set no bounds to his libidinous intercourse with women, but never betrayed any unnatural desires for the other sex. As mentioned at the start of the video, both Antoninus Pius and his adoptive son, Marcus Aurelius, were both extremely chaste. Perhaps the poster child for homosexuality in ancient Rome, though, is Emperor Hadrian. He's said by pro-gay scholars to have kept a young man from Bithynia named Antonus as his sexual partner. According to them, this relationship was likely open and considered unproblematic by Hadrian's contemporaries because one, Antonus was a boy, not a full-grown man, and two, he wasn't a Roman, so he wouldn't have been corrupting any of their own citizens. As the story goes, Antonus died while in Egypt with Hadrian. Hadrian, because he loved him so much, became extremely distraught and even wept for the boy, something for which he was harshly criticized. He later had Antonus deified and created a new city in Egypt, Antonopolis, in his honor. So was Hadrian gay. And is this perhaps the first example of an emperor who was openly gay and not censured for it? Well, despite what the dozens of pro-gay articles on Google will tell you, we don't really know. If we look into the historical sources, no definitive answer on their relationship is ever given. First from Cassius Dia. Antonus was from Bithynium, a city in Bithynia which we also call Claudiopolis. He had been a favorite of the emperor and had died in Egypt, either by falling into the Nile, as Hadrian writes, or, as is the truth, by being offered in sacrifice. For Hadrian, as I have stated, was always very curious and employed divinations and incantations of all kinds. Accordingly, he honored Antonus, either because of his love for him or because the youth had voluntarily undertaken to die, it being necessary that a life should be surrendered freely for the accomplishment of the ends Hadrian had in view, by building a city on the spot where he had suffered this fate and naming it after him. And he also set up statues, or rather sacred images, of him, practically all over the world. On this account, then, he became the object of some ridicule, and also because at the death of his sister Paulina, he had not immediately paid her any honor. So according to Dio, Antonus didn't simply die, but rather was killed. That Hadrian was told some prophecy that someone must be sacrificed in order to accomplish some goal or avoid some ill, and Antonus stepped up. Hadrian, feeling grateful for the sacrifice and probably feeling bad that someone had to die for his sake, deified him and gave him all sorts of posthumous honors. There is nothing in the story that suggests homosexuality, so where do these claims come from? Well, they may have stemmed in large part from much later writings. In the Historia Augusta, for example, published sometime in the 4th century AD, we get this passage. During a journey on the Nile, Hadrian lost Antonus, his favorite, 
and for this youth he wept like a woman. Concerning this incident, there are varying rumors. For some claim that he had devoted himself to death for Hadrian, and others what both his beauty and Hadrian's sensuality suggest. But however this may be, the Greeks deified him at Hadrian's request, and declared that oracles were given through his agency, but these, it is commonly asserted, were composed by Hadrian himself. Also from the 4th century, we get this passage in the book De Caesaribus. Hadrian himself, as is the custom with the fortunate rich, built palaces and devoted himself to dinner parties, statuary, and paintings, and finally took sufficient pains to procure every luxury and plaything. From this sprang the malicious rumors that he had debauched young men, and that he had burned with passion for the scandalous attentions of Antonus, and that for no other reason he had founded a city named after him and had erected statues to the youth. Some, to be sure, maintain that these were acts of piety and religious scruples, because when Hadrian wanted to prolong his life and magicians had demanded a volunteer take his place, they report that although everyone else refused, Antonus offered himself, and for this reason the honors mentioned above were accorded him. We shall leave the matter unresolved, although with someone of a self-indulgent nature, we are suspicious of a relationship between men far apart in age. So we have rumors published in the mid to late 4th century AD which say that Hadrian and Antonus were sexually involved. But there are two things to note about these rumors. One, Hadrian died in 138 AD, so these come more than 200 years after his death. And two, the authors state clearly that these rumors are scandalous, meaning that, again, even if they were true, it would not have been approved of. Realistically, there was nothing which definitively suggests that Hadrian was a homosexual, only rumor. And while these rumors truly are ancient, the reason the Hadrian as a homosexual myth is around today can probably be attributed to contemporary works, most notably the fiction novel Memoirs of Hadrian from 1951. In it, Hadrian is openly homosexual for Antonus, and loves him in the modern gay sense of that word. This isn't unlike what has been done to Achilles and Patroclus by the book The Song of Achilles. The source material in both of these cases did not at all suggest that these men were homosexual, but these books, little more than sexed up fanfics, managed to make popular this idea anyhow. Another story I think sheds light on our topic is the scandal surrounding the Bacchanalia, recorded most notably by Livy. In his history, he tells us how a cult to the god Bacchus devolves into wanton immorality, both sexual and non-sexual, including the sexual assault of young men, not only citizens, but slaves and freedmen as well. Now, this isn't a story directly about homosexuality because, again, the Romans discussed that very infrequently, but it does comment on it. I will relay the story here, trying to use mostly quotes from Livy to do so, and I will stop off at those sections which discuss our topic. The story begins with the investigation of the cult by consuls, where they begin to learn about what was going on. They find out the following. When they were heated with wine and the nightly commingling of men and women, those of tender age with their seniors had extinguished all sense of modesty. Debaucheries of every kind commenced. Each had pleasures at hand to satisfy the lust he was most prone to. Nor was the mischief confined to the promiscuous intercourse of men and women. False witness, the forging of seals and testaments, and false informations, all proceeding from the same source. As also poisonings and murders of families where the bodies could not even be found for burial. So no direct talk of homosexuality yet, but you can see how problematic the cult was. The story turns to discuss how the consuls came to know these details. It turns out that their informant was a freed woman named Hispala Ficenia. A freed woman or a freed man is simply someone who was born a slave but then subsequently freed. Hispala has a lover, a young man named Abucius. Abucius mentions casually one day that his stepfather is having him initiated into the Bacchic cult. Hispala, however, knows something of this cult. When she was a slave, her master had forced her to be initiated, and she knew what evil went on there. She was concerned for Abucius, saying, Your stepfather, then, is by this act hurrying on the ruin of your modesty, your reputation, your hopes, and your life. Here is how Hispala describes what goes on there. It was a matter of common knowledge that no one had been initiated for the last two years above the age of 20. As each person was brought in, he was handed over to the priests like a victim, and taken into a place which resounded with yells and songs, and the jangling of cymbals and drums, so that no cry from those who were suffering violation could be heard. She then begged and implored him to get out of the affair whatever way he could, and not to rush blindly into a place where he would first have to endure and then commit every conceivable outrage. So we have priests who, as part of the initiation, sexually violate both males and females, although she seemingly only mentions the men here. Interesting too is the fact that Hispala was a slave when she was initiated. Pro-gay scholars would have us believe that the sexual abuse of slaves, both male and female, was completely tolerated. Yet as we'll see, these rights were abhorred, and it wasn't only citizens who were initiated. Eventually, the consuls are told that Hispala knows the details of the cult and they bring her before them to make testimony. At first, she was nervous to even confess her involvement with the cult, as clearly they were not looked upon kindly. And she declared that while she stood in great fear of the gods whose occult mystery she was revealing, she stood in much greater fear of men, 
who would tear her to pieces if she turned informer. So she begged Sulpicia and the consul to remove her to some place outside the borders of Italy, where she could pass the rest of her days in safety. Eventually, they guarantee her safety, and she makes this testimony. At first, they were confined to women. No male was admitted, and they had three stated days in the year on which persons were initiated during the daytime, and matrons were chosen to act as priestesses. Pachula Ania, a companion, when she was priestess, made a complete change, as though by divine motion, for she was the first to admit men, and she initiated her own sons. At the same time, she made the rite a nocturnal one, and instead of three days in the year, celebrated it five times a month. When once the mysteries had assumed this promiscuous character and men were mingled with women, with all the license of nocturnal orgies, there was no crime, no deed of shame wanting. More uncleanliness was wrought by men with men than with women. Whoever would not submit to defilement or shrink from violating others was sacrificed as a victim. To regard nothing as impious or criminal was the very sum of their religion. I think that line about men with men speaks for itself. There is within it no indication at all of the standard academic interpretation of Roman homosexuality that the active partner was blameless. In fact, he was considered a criminal, who, as we will see later, spoiler alert, was to be put to death. The consuls then take this information to the Senate, who immediately take action to shut down the cult. Those who presided over these mysteries were to be sought out not only in Rome, but everywhere where people were in the habit of assembling, so that they might be delivered up to the consuls. Edicts were published in Rome and throughout Italy, forbidding any who had been initiated from meeting together to celebrate their mysteries, or performing any rites of a similar character. And above all, Strict inquiry was to be made in the case of those who attended gatherings in which crime and debauchery had occurred. These were the measures which the Senate decreed. About the matter, the consul Postumius then addressed the people. It is these gods whom your ancestors ordained that we should worship, reverence, and pray to, not those who have driven the minds of people enslaved by foul and foreign superstitions, as though by goading furies into every form of crime and every kind of lust. Whatever I say, you may be certain that it does not come up to the enormity and horror of the thing. As to their number, he clarifies, more than 7,000 men and women were involved. He continues and now directly addresses the male homosexuality that took place. If you knew at what ages males were initiated, you would not only feel pity for them, but also shame. Do you think, citizens, that youths initiated by this oath should be made soldiers? That arms should be entrusted to men mustered from this foul shrine? Will men, debased by their own debauchery and that of others, fight to the death on behalf of the chastity of your wives and children? Now this line is very interesting. First, the consul says that the age of the initiates is troubling, and yet it was told by Hispala that only men under the age of 20 were ever initiated, this being well within the range of supposed accepted pederastic relationships. Now, of course, some of these initiates were citizens, which would have been extra troubling to the Romans, but many weren't. Many were slaves and freedmen, like I said above. Also, the line, will men debased by their own debauchery and that of others, seems to suggest that these men were not only penetrated, but also penetrated others. No distinction is made which indicates that the active partner is not to be blamed. Yet it would be less serious if the wrongdoing had merely made them effeminate. That was in great measure their personal dishonor. And if they had kept their hands from crime and their thoughts from evil designs. Never has there been so much evil in the state, nor affecting so many people in so many ways. Whatever villainy there has been in recent years due to lust, whatever to fraud, whatever to crime, I tell you has arisen from this one cult. Now the first part of this quote is interesting, because it tells us that if these men had merely been sexually violated, had merely been made effeminatus, that would be one thing. Of course, not approved of, but it wouldn't have been a huge threat to society. This, of course, serves to reinforce the fact that passive homosexuality was viewed negatively. Nothing new here. But because he explicitly calls out sexual crimes by mentioning villainy due to lust, and he has already absolved the passive homosexuals as less blameworthy, we can again assume that he is censuring the active homosexuals in this case. But moving on with the story. The consuls now call for the immediate arrest of all those involved in the cult. Those who had polluted themselves by outrage and murder, those who had stained themselves by giving false evidence, forging seals and wills, and by other fraudulent practices, were sentenced to death. Now, we don't know for certain, but this passage may include another reference to homosexual sex. The word outrage in the original Latin is actually stuprum. The concept of stuprum almost always refers to one in a variety of sexual improprieties. If a married woman committed adultery, this was stuprum. If a man submitted to being penetrated, stuprum. Now, pro-gay scholars would argue that only passive partners would have committed stuprum. But as we have already seen, this story indicates that the active partners were just as guilty, if not more, than the passive ones. The number of those executed exceeded the number of those sentenced to imprisonment. There was an enormous number of men, as well as women in both classes. The women who had been found guilty were handed over to their relatives or guardians to be dealt with privately. If there was no one capable of inflicting punishment, they were executed publicly. So, in summation, we have a deviant cult who is committing all sorts of unapproved of acts, including forgery of documents, murder, 
and homosexual sex. We have reason to believe, too, that it was not just the passive partners, but the active partners, and especially them, who were found guilty and put to death. This story, which explicitly problematizes the homosexual sex far more than the heterosexual sex, simply cannot have occurred in the ancient Roman world as conceived of by the pro-gay scholars. We should also talk briefly about graffiti which offers a rare insight into the life of the plebs. With the uncovering of Pompeii and Herculaneum, archaeologists have discovered and cataloged the various bits people wrote on walls in public places. Most are incomplete fragments or just total nonsense. The complete sentences that we have are mostly non-sexual, of course. My favorite coming from a man named Samius, who told Cornelius, go hang yourself. Among the sexual graffiti, though, almost all of them are just men bragging about how many women they have had sex with. Apelles Moose and his brother Dexter each pleasurably had sex with two girls twice. My lusty son, with how many women have you had sexual relations? Take hold of your servant girl whenever you want. It's your right. Gaius Valerius Venestus, soldier of the first Praetorian cohort in the century of Rufus, screwer of women. And the list goes on. Of every bit of graffiti scribbled across the walls of the city, there are three which people like to say indicate homosexual behavior, but frankly, I'm not fully convinced. I will read you these three examples now and then give you my take on them. Our first graffito reads, Amplicatus, I know that Icarus is buggering you. Salvius wrote this. Again, we have here an accusation of homosexuality. Given the general maturity of these messages, though, I don't know if we can really take this as proof that anyone was gay. And even if this was proof, it would go to reinforce Rome's disapproval of passive homosexuals. Next, we have the rather terse, I have buggered men. Seems pretty gay. Until you realize this was scrawled on the side of a man's house, and it was probably some Roman's idea of a prank. And again, if it is, it's another example of disparaging homosexual sex. Lastly, we have the one bit of graffiti that might have actually been written by a gay guy. And it reads, Weep, you girls, my penis has given you up. Now it penetrates men's behinds. Goodbye, wondrous femininity. Now is this gay? Yeah, maybe. But I will add in as a note of nuance, we again don't know if this was meant to be serious or not. And frankly, so many of these messages are meant to be satirical, I don't know if it's wise to take this one seriously. While it may seem more likely at first that this was truly written by a gay man, when every other single piece of graffiti doesn't fit in with the idea that this one seems to indicate, then it becomes not unreasonable to come up with some other, less apparent explanation for its existence. The author didn't leave his name, so this could be satirical or it could be insinuating that another man is homosexual. Now, I could continue on with this for quite a while, but this video has already run long. I'll just wrap up by saying that homosexuality as it exists today simply was not very prevalent in ancient Rome, and it certainly was never approved of in any of its forms. When the Romans could be bothered to even comment on it, it was always negative. Adult male-on-male -male relationships were always hated, with the passive partner receiving extra vitriol. While it does seem to be the case that sexual abuse of male slaves and sexual pederastic relationships did sometimes occur, we only know about these because of crude jokes and denunciations. When studying history, there is always a temptation, usually something you're not even aware of, to interpret the past through your own contemporary lens. This no doubt occurred in the past, when scholars refused to recognize any homosexual behavior that went on in ancient times. But now, modern scholars are making the same mistake. Because our culture is generally accepting of homosexuality, they impart these views on the people of the past and corrupt what they believed as a result. Yes, they did not conceive of homosexuality as we do today. In fact, they likely didn't conceive of anything exactly as we do today. But to use this as an excuse to warp their beliefs into something which conveniently meshes with the beliefs of modern homosexuals is historical perjury, a lie which requires ignoring the mountains of evidence that people denounced these practices. I hope this video can serve as an easy-to-access reference to push back against this popular misunderstanding. Thank you all for watching.